Now we should. Well, good evening. Good afternoon. Well, y'all are just about, we've come here to celebrate. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, we've come uh, to celebrate the life of a wonderful young woman who gave so much of her time, even though she didn't feel well, to helping others. And we've come to celebrate that today. Now, if she could say a word to you today, she'd say, my goodness, what a crowd. <coughs> and she'd say also, now y'all make sure this crowd is somewhere in church tomorrow. <laughs> you know, that's just the way she was. But it's good to see you. I'm Wayne Rowan. I'm the pastor of this church. And I knew Susan, loved Susan and love her family, and I just want to open us up with a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to have a, a time of celebration here, and song, and everything, and then Brother Paul Blair, from New Antioch Primitive Baptist Church, will come and share. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you, and I thank you for another beautiful day. Lord, I thank you for Susan Britt. I thank you, Lord, for the smiles and how it was contagious. Her laughter, her work with children and with senior adults. And Lord, how she gave so much and how, Lord, she required so little. And Lord, I thank you for her life. I thank you, Lord, for her parents and her aunts and uncles that are part of this church. And, Lord, we just lift them up to you, the family, Lord. But we know uh, exact, exactly where Susan's at. You know, it's really hard to miss something when you know where it really is. But, Lord, we'll miss her. We'll miss her, her, her exuberant spirit she had. And, Lord, go with us now through this memorial service, homegoing service, celebration service of the life of Susan Britt. And Lord, we'll give you all the honor, glory, and praise for everything that's said and done. And may everything be done according to your perfect and divine will. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <Brother> Paul. <coughs> With me this week that uh, he and Susan in the recent past had got together and sang some songs together and this is one of the songs that they sang together and Brian would like to have this song as a congregational hymn acapella will do the best we can <laughs> Oh, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This honor song, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest trial and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When prayers are said, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took 
It is a blessing to get to meet uh, you all. I wish that I had known Sister Susan longer. I only met her briefly at Ryan's baptism. But I'm finding out that she was an extraordinary woman. Susan Britt age 33, passed away on Monday, July 1st, 2024. She was born on December 30th, 1990 in Jackson, Tennessee to Randy and Sonia Britt. Susan was preceded in death by her paternal grandparents, Ellis and Norris Britt, and maternal grandfather, Charles Joyner. She is survived by her parents, Randy and Sonia Britt of Blue Goose, brother Ryan Britt of Blue Goose, maternal grandmother Betty Joyner, and fur baby Toby. <laughs> Susan's favorite Bible verse was Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So that's a great outlook, isn't it? It's the best outlook. I had some things come to my mind um, last night and this morning, and they had to do with, of course, life and death. Philippians 1, 19, Paul would write, after dealing with a few other issues, uh, making mention of a few issues, 
He said, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I should shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, when we read of the word hope in the scriptures, it's not used in the same context that we use it hope in our English language today. Most of the time when people say, I hope this will happen, that really what they really mean to say is, I wish this is going to happen. <laughs> when the word hope is used in the scriptures, it means I expect this to happen earnestly. It's an earnest expectation that I have. And hope always has something uh, in view, always has the future in view, never the past. Hope is something that is not seen. Hope, if a man, Paul says, if a man sees it, why does he still hope for it? If he's already got it, why does he hope for it. So hope is an expectation. And Paul tells this church at Philippi, he says, it's better for me to go on and be with the Lord. And we know that it's, uh, that we're, when we're at home in the body, Paul says, we're absent from the Lord. And so from, it's always difficult though, to be separated from our loved ones. It's uh, in this life. Uh, from our perspective, it is, uh, we want them to continue on just like they always have. Right. We want them, we want things to be the way that they always were. We want still to have them, to hold them, to love on them, to, to enjoy and, and make more memories with them. That's from our perspective. But from God's perspective, he is, they're not home yet. But when they're absent from the body and they're called home, then God has them there with him. They're home. You know, <clears throat> in Psalms, Brother Wayne probably knows the exact Psalm, says, David said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Right. It's difficult for us, isn't it? It's hard for us to let them go. It's hard for us to, to and we grieve, and there's a great difficulty and, and, and mourning in death. But God rejoices <laughs> because really, what's the difference? between a child that's even unborn and the oldest man that ever lived. What's the difference? Time and experiences are the only difference. From God's perspective, they're just the same at the, even the unborn as if they've lived 120 years. From God's perspective, they're his children at the beginning. They're his children at the end. They'll always be his children. Right. I like that, don't you? That gives me great uh, assurance to know that the sovereign God, uh, our creator, is not bothered by anything. 
He's not uh, delayed by anything. Uh, that's good stuff. Now, Paul says, and uh, while, we're, uh, um, while we're in this body, we're separated from the completeness of the Lord. That doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't interact with us or, or touch us or that we can't feel him while we're in this body. That doesn't mean that we're totally absent from the Lord when we're in this body, but we're absent from the completeness in the Lord when we're in this body. That's what Paul means. Now, <clears throat> another proof is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. Paul says, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. Did you hear that? Paul says we're willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Look, if the if the best that you got is down here, you're, you're going to. If you think this is all that there is, you may be disappointed. <clears throat> uh, we don't want to be disappointed, do we? <laughs> I, I tell you what, when, when we, we can't even imagine, you know, that uh, 8 and 18, Romans 8 and 18, her favorite verse. For I reckon, that's not, that, that's a good old country term, isn't it? I reckon. <laughs> I'm from Mississippi. We used to say that all the time. I reckon. Uh, that means uh, from the best information I got, I've made this determination. But a reckoning is a, it's really a financial, an accounting term that means that what it is, is what it is. And Paul says, for I reckon I have uh, done all the tallying and this is the sum of the matter that what uh, the sufferings that we experience in this life are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That means no matter how bad it gets for you here, uh, talk to Job and see how bad it was. No matter how bad it gets down here, the bad don't even compare with just one second of the good in glory. It don't even compare. Can't even compare it. Now, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Did y'all hear that? It didn't say they didn't have a wish said they didn't have a hope. That means they didn't expect anything. They didn't have any earnest expectation. They, they, uh, there's a lot of people that sorrow. Paul's not telling you not to sorrow. He's telling you to sorrow, but not to sorrow like those that have no hope. We ought to sorrow, and it is hard to lose our loved ones. It's hard to lose those that are dearest and, and, and closest to us. But, and we ought to sorrow. Man, I tell you what, when I uh, see somebody at a funeral and their close relative dies and they, they're there and stoic and hard, I, I tell you what, <clears throat> either, the, and everybody agrees in their different way. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I, I have to think, man, how close were they if they don't? If they don't shed a tear, if it doesn't move them in some way, if they're not uh, distressed at some point about the loss, I wonder, are they sorrowing at all? But everybody sorrows in a different way, don't they? Some people internalize it. Some, it may hit, it may hit you, Brother Randy, two weeks from now. It may hit you a year from now. But it will hit you. Paul says, 
I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Y'all believe that? Yes. I believe it. I believe it not, not only because this word says it. I believe it because God authored it in my heart. That's how I know it. I didn't just take somebody's word for it. I took God's word on it. Not the words on the page, the word he wrote, authored in my heart. Now, he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Did you know that Susan is sleeping in Jesus right now? Will God bring with him for this? We say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That, do, that doesn't mean that you're going to keep them from coming back with him. That means that you're not going to precede them or go before them. Now, we're not going to precede them which are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. You know, that's what we're doing today. Isn't it? We're comforting each other with the words, the only words that can comfort. You know, it's an awkward thing to speak to someone that's lost a loved one. What do you say? And it's awkward for them because they don't know what to tell you back. It's a strange thing, isn't it? How many of y'all feel awkward? I do. What can you say? <clears throat> Well, you can say this because you can bank on the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. You can say that I don't know what life's going to be like for you now, but one day when the Lord splits the heavens wide open and the trump from God sounds and he gives that shout, and my friends, it's not a shout of pain. It's not a shout of distress. It's a shout of victory. That victory he shouted on the cross. You know, when he gave that cry and he said it is finished, it wasn't a cry like, oh my gosh. It was a cry of victory. And did you know he was in his full vigor when he let out that cry? He was not weak at all. Y'all don't know my mama. Some of you do, but on her deathbed, and you've seen it when people there at the point of death and their body's so weak and they just mumble and nothing comes out. My friends, when the Lord said it is finished, he was in full vigor and he gave up the ghost. They didn't take it from him. He gave up the ghost. And because he lives, we live too. And did you know, do you, if you believe that he died, I trust all of you believe that he rose again. And if he rose again, he's coming again. And if he's coming again, he's coming to get you and me and all of his children that he paid for because he's a good businessman. You know, the Lord, when, uh, have y'all ever gone to the grocery store and you got out and you paid for something that, uh, that was, uh, you know, your milk or something and you got out to the car and you forgot to put it in your car and you went back to get it and it wasn't there. My friends, that's not the way the Lord's going to do it because he's going to get what he paid for. Y'all like that? I like it. It sounds good to me. You know, there is a sting of death. But Paul in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is mocking it. He seems to be mocking the grave. When he says, oh grave, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Right now it seems like the grave is victorious. Oh, but not finally. 
They can't, they can't help. The grave is not going to be able to help but give up its prey. And the Lord's going to take us home to be with him in glory. That's good news to me. Comfort one another with these words. May God bless you is my prayer. My name is Paul Moroy, and this is my wife, Mary. There is an old Irish proverb. Go something like this. Friends are to be treated as family. Family is to act like friends. For it is in the shelter of each other in which we live. I've known Randy for over 50 years. He's like a brother to me. And if he's like a brother, Sonia's like a sister, Ryan's like a nephew, Susan's like a sister, like a niece. I've known Randy since we were in Lexington High School. And I want to thank the Joyner and the Britt family for including Mary and myself as honorary uncles and aunts. Y'all are an extended family of our family as well. There isn't enough space on a four, on a five by seven card to express the sorrow we feel with Susan's death. There's not enough paper, there's not enough ink to accept, express how much we appreciate the love and the memories that she gives us. Randy and Sonia, y'all are shining examples of what a Christian family should be. Susan and Ryan are blessed to have you as parents. Ryan is blessed to have had a sister like Susan. And Susan enriched all of our lives. And we will never forget her. Just like we will never forget the salvation of Jesus Christ who suffered, bled, died, and rose again on the third day. I met Susan when she was just a few hours old. And I've never seen Randy and Sonia so happy. And the second time Mary and I saw them that happy was when Ryan was born. As Christians, we share each other's joys, we bear each other's sorrows, and we look forward to that day in heaven where we'll be reunited. Amen. Amen. Susan's faith was built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. The cornerstone of this foundation was first laid by our parents, Randy and Sonia, and then Ryan came along and laid another cornerstone, and friends and extended family laid the other cornerstones. In her final years, Susan struggled with a long illness, but she did not struggle alone. She didn't feel sorry for herself, and she didn't want other people to feel sorry for her. She gave herself to the one who outloves and outforgives all others, and that one is Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and being blessed by Jesus and guided by his loving hand, Susan displayed a rare courage. She lived life on life's terms in spite of the circumstances. How many of us can say that today? My wife tells me that with every death, learn something, learn something. Susan's life and her death reaffirmed a truth that when we depart this human coil, only one thing is going to matter. One thing and one thing only is what is our relationship with Jesus Christ, right. which what we need to ask ourselves today. What is my relationship with Jesus Christ? My wife, Mary, and Susan shared a lot in common. Both posted scriptures all over the house, keeping close to God's word. 
Mary will now share with you the scriptures shared between themselves. Susan was a born again, blood covenant member of the family of God. She stayed consistent in her strong faith because faith was her way of life. She did what she did when times were hard as well as when times were easy. I know her faith pleased God. She was a good soldier in Christ, an example to us all, and a precious child of God. We are blessed for having known her. There is a verse in Psalms written that, that was written on a special project that Susan did when she was younger, and I still have a picture of it. And it's Psalms 56.3, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I wanted to share three scriptures that remind me um, of her homegoing. Uh, the first, the next two were what uh, Pastor Blair had mentioned. First Thessalonians 4.13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, so that you do not grieve like those who have no hope. And First Corinth, Corinthians 15.55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And Revelations 21.4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. Amen. We say this in Christ's love. We, we, we wish Christ, we hope Christ's blessings upon everyone. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, brother. My experience with the Brits goes back a long time. Randy and Shonda were members of First Baptist Church. Shonda and Nancy started a library, church library together and worked together for a number of years. I love Susan. Had the privilege of baptizing her in the Lord Jesus. For many years, I didn't see Susan. Back in March, was it March when I, April when you had the surgery? March 19th. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I spent six weeks here at uh, Huron on Sunday morning. Rodney preached on Sunday night, and like John came on Wednesday night. And got to be with Susan again. I remembered Susan as she was as a little girl. And I guess she saw me looking at her because I had not seen her as a young woman. But I do know one thing. She was committed to Jesus. And she was confirmed in the Lord by the Holy Spirit. And she lived a life that was consistent with the faith that she professed in the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. That's what it means to walk with the Lord. I want to share with you just a half of a verse of Scripture. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 10. I'm not going to take the time to give you the background of it, but I just want to share the verse, half a verse. It's a request, or at least it's a wish. Let me die the death of the righteous, and may my final end be like his. A little boy one day on Sunday morning had been dressed by his mother. He went out to play while his mother and dad finished dressing. When it was time to go, 
they opened the door, and there he stood just dripping wet and muddy. She said, son, go upstairs, and I'll help you take a bath. He said, I don't want a bath. She said, go on, you've got to have a bath. He said, Mama, I don't want to be clean. I just want to be forgiven. I think that's the way a lot of people receive an invitation of Jesus. They really don't want to be clean. They want to be forgiven. But you know, the forgiveness of God is a cleansing forgiveness. Without holiness, the Bible says, no one shall see God. I have prayed and prayed and prayed for holiness. And I realized it became mine when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. He is the one that makes us holy. If we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we're holy. That means different. And if you're not different, then you're not in Christ. We have to walk with him. There are just two kinds of ways a person can die. They can die the death of the wicked, or they can die the death of the righteous. Let me die the death of the righteous, and may my last end be like his. Who are the righteous? The righteous are those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and have received him into their heart so that they're born again. Titus 3.5 makes it plain how one gets the status of righteous. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So when one repents of their sins, receiving Christ as their Savior, according to Romans 3.28, they are justified by faith. Not by works, but by faith. Right. Thank you just a moment about the death of the righteous. That was the request of Balaam. Let me die the death of the righteous. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Everybody wants to die the death of the righteous, but not everybody wants to be righteous. That's why I shared the story just a moment ago. The old preacher Spurgeon said the righteous die in the arms of a friend. The last time I saw Susan alive, she was in the hospital. But you know, she was joyous. She was lying in the bed, but she wasn't covered up. She was lying on the bed. Uh, she was bubbly. And she just, if you look at her big smile, that's when I walked in the room, who she just lit up. That was the way Susan was. As our first preacher said, the righteous die with a hope, with a better hope, with an eternal hope. Job 14.14 14 asks an essential question. If a man die, shall he live again? Well, yes, he will. If he's in Christ. Right. But not if he's not in Christ. So just a moment, let's think about the last end of the righteous. Let my last end be like his. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, The dead in Christ rise first. I want to rise on that morning, don't you? Amen. Amen. Do you know what the righteous do to get to heaven? They just believe. That's right. And they just trust. And with the Holy Spirit that they receive within them, they walk in the Lord. I think Revelation 19.5 says something to us we need to hear. 
And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants. Spurgeon again said, Let me wave the palm of victory. Let me wear the crown of triumph. Let me be girded about with the fire linen of immaculate perfection. Let me cast my throne crowns before Jehovah's feet. Let me swell with everlasting song. Let my voice make one that eternal course. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He said, oh, how I will sing. How sweetly shall my voice be attuned to notes of gratitude. Let me die the death of the righteous. Isn't God gracious? Always. Oh, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's what Susan did. She didn't lie alone. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place again for you, I will come again and receive you that you might be where I am. Long time ago, Minister of Music named David Holmes told me a message for you and Randy and Sheldon Brian, Brian. If you know where they are, you have not lost them. You're just separated. Yeah, amen. 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 God bless you, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.
climbing trees. Um, I got stuck. <laughs> Had to let one of the guys catch me. And here she is, just masterminding the whole situation. She was really good at thinking of ways to get out of situations and stuff. Um, she used to make us these meals. Um, she made bow tie chicken. If y'all have not had it, y'all need it. It's wonderful. So every time I eat it, the whole pan. I will take it to her. Always would get us together for sleepovers and we would watch usually Christian movies. Some of us were crybabies, I was one of those. And sometimes she would join with us. So when part of my speech, it'll kind of mention some of these memories and stuff. But I learned a lot from what she would teach us. The prayers that we would have together, watching these movies about the Word of God and stuff, and just crying together, laughing together. Sometimes some of us had accidents. <laughs> but <laughs> those are great memories to me. Like, I hold on to the sincere things are very sentimental to me. But when she started the great the Grace Dance team, I had like two friends. I was very lonely. I never did anything. She brought a group of girls with many differences and struggles together. She never acted as if, as if she were perfect. She opened up to us. She taught us love, forgiveness, strength, courage, and how to have fun while serving and living for the Lord. That girl had the most spirit and dedication to God. She never lost all of in faith. I admire her strength and determination to serve him until her last breath. She pushed herself and gave it all she got. My peace and comfort is thinking that now she can dance to her heart's content, skate with no walls and no fall, that she's up there eating all the bow tie chicken and snacks she enjoyed, <laughs> climbing the tallest of trees, watching the best of heartfelt movies, and simply being free of no more pain or sorrow with the God who created her. I will think of her often, and I may even break down and wear some jingle bells on my shoes in the Christmas time. <laughs> we love you, Susan. Public to be all in, but not something that touches so close to home. And I really thought that we were going to dance today, so therefore I've had no speech. So when the family asked me, hey, she'll do something today, I found myself sitting back there completely speechless. Not because I have nothing to say, but simply because I have so much I need to say, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be this time. We don't have time for that. But my name is Brittany. I see a lot of familiar faces out here, so just real briefly, I need everyone in the audience to close their eyes. So just bow your hand and close your eyes for me. What I ask of you to do is think of a moment with Susan. Think of a time where you and guys, y'all spent together, and whenever I tell you to open your eyes, I'll ask you a question. Alrighty guys, open your eyes for me. I hope in the 10 seconds that I gave you, you each thought back on a moment with Susan and you're now smiling because that's what she would want you all to do. Like I said, today is a day of celebration, so I'm not gonna make it sad because Katana's is the funny one out of the bunch, so that's why I go second. But I just wanted to tell you guys what Susan did for me real quick. Um, I was 10 years old at our local church and I'll never forget it. I was crying in the pews on my hands and knees, begging to God, please help me. I was just crying, I'll never forget it. And I feel like God handpicked her to come to me. She comes over to me. She gets down, and we're all praying. And she's like, what's going on? I was 10 years old. I said, I'm getting abused at home by my parents. I'm hungry. I've been sexually abused. I have no one. I don't want to go home. She looks at me. She's like, open your eyes. You know. She's talking to me. And she goes, well, I can't keep you forever. Little did she know. We went drove straight to my real parents' house that night. She talked to my parents. I lived with her for six years after that night. She never asked for anything in return. She shaped me into the person that I am today. Today, I'm loyal, I'm responsible, I try to be as intelligent as I can, and I always put God first. So into my adult years, I wound up actually buying a house that's pretty much close to her family. I had no idea. So I reached out to her, and I wanted to give, because you can't give back. You know, you wind up growing up, and you go your separate ways. But for some reason, she was on my heart. So I wound up texting her. Because she never, after I said, hey, you know, I'm getting close to adulthood. I'm going to try to go my separate way because I was young. You know, <coughs> you just grow apart. So I texted her and I said, God is laying this on my heart. I said, I became a law enforcement officer in Madison County. And I just graduated from the police academy. I said, and honestly, it was you who did this for me. 
I said, without you feeding me, closing me, taking me on my first vacation, doing all those things that a child needed, I wouldn't have anybody. I would probably still be in the trailer park, God knows where. I said, so I want to tell you thank you. So I just want to read you guys what she sent me after I sent her that, because I truly would probably be no one without her. She said, after the testimony, thank you so much for sharing that with me. It means more to me than any words will ever say. It makes my heart incredibly happy to hear that things are going so well for you and to see you still following God. If there's anything at all that I wanted my dance kids to learn from me is that my prayer has always been that you guys would learn to love Jesus. I'm so proud of you, Brittany. I love you so much, and I loved you so much when you were a kid. I know God put you in my life for a purpose, and I will always, always love you. I'm always so thankful for the opportunity that I had to pour into you all those years. So I texted her back, and I said, because of you, me being a cop, I can pour into others as you poured into me, because you're exactly who I needed when I was younger. So I just want to say that Susan not only impacted me, but I see Shelby. She was so, so much for Shelby. We were in the same shoes. So it's kids like me who come from absolutely nothing that she may feel somebody. So today to sit here, to have friends and family, just to know how heavy she impacted us, that she's not always gone. She's still with me because I can still pour into kids who need me because I can't have children, just as much as she gave to me. So we just really miss Susan, and we're also thankful on behalf of the whole dance team for taking children like us who have no one to still be in friends today so we'll never be alone. So she really jeopardized a lot and put God in the center of everything. So thank you, guys. Amen. never know the lives we impact. Amen. So we live our life every day before the Lord to show Him to everyone we come in contact with. Amen. Not necessarily by a sermon, but a lot of people do the see a good sermon is here, one. So, uh, you know, you just need to understand that we are responsible. God left us here for a purpose. And the only thing that's missing in this service right now is one thing. Pluto. And here she'd go right back. 
I said, that's not going to mess you up, is it? She said, I won't tell if you do. <laughs> well, anyway, she always had one while she was here and took one home with her. <laughs> but it was a pleasure to be around Susan. She was really a joy. And she had such a loving family. Not only her mom and dad, but her aunts and uncles, and especially her grandma. And when we got the news, I went right straight to Miss Betty's house. Because I knew how close her and Susan were. But God is gracious, amen? amen? He gives us strength when we don't think we have any strength. He gives us grace when everything else fails. He's there. And I was thinking, we just got back from vacation. We went down to see my grandson and some other grandchildren and great-granddaughter, our first and she happened to show up down there, so you know everything else went away with her. And uh, But we stayed and had a great time and got home Saturday and come home with, we call it the epizootie. I don't know what y'all might call it, but I got a head cold and, and everything. It's a whole lot better now, but it was pitiful for a while. But uh, Miss Sonia said, You've got to get better. You've got to be better. I said, well, don't you worry about it. Me and God got this took care of. But I've chosen to read today the 23rd Psalm. To me, it is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And it deals with life. It deals also with tragedy and death. But it also deals with a peace that passes all understanding. The 23rd Psalm says this. Says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to say forever and forever, amen. amen. Because we serve an eternal God, amen. not a temporary God. And when you are born again, you're given eternal life, not a temporary life. Amen. And so I know without a shadow of a doubt, the moment that the Holy Spirit took up residence in my life, my heart, and I became a child of God through my faith in him and his grace toward me and through his precious son's blood that was shed on Calvary. Now, I know we, we like to be on the upbeat thing around here today because this is a celebration. But I, I know that I would be really put aback if I did not tell you Every one of us is going to have to pass this way one day. Every one of us. The only thing that I can think of that would not allow me to taste death is for the rapture to occur and God to come and take me out while I'm alive. Now, I think that I, I don't know whether I'd be cheated by being raptured or waiting around for Jesus' hand to touch me at my last breath. It's a conundrum. But I tell you what, whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord. Amen. Nothing.
can change that. Nothing. I want to look at a few things in here that I think represents Susan in this passage of Scripture. It's not going to be real long. I mean, the first thing that I see here, it tells us of the personal knowledge of the shepherd. Personal knowledge of it. The Lord is my shepherd. That's ownership, amen? He owns me, and I own him. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I'm reminded one time a little girl came to the pulpit and she was in Sunday school. She was going to recite the 23rd Psalms. Her mom and daddy were all swelled up with pride. She was about five years old. Preacher grabbed that microphone. She got up there and cleared her throat and she said, The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. <laughs> the microphone down, went back to her mom. <laughs> A lot of truth in that, amen? <laughs> Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. You know, when you think about that personal relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, the shepherd is not a hireling. Amen. The shepherd would give his life for his sheep. He'd fight off anything that came to destroy his sheep. Wolves, bears, lions, even thieves. Because, you know, we got thieves today coming in and around God's sheep trying to destroy and take them away for all kinds of strange wind of doctrines. And, you know, Jesus, he stands right there. But see, the problem is that we don't have enough folks that will tell the story truthfully. Right? They may tell a story, but I'm not so sure it's filled with truth. So it talks about that personal relationship that Susan had, a personal knowledge of the shepherd. I believe that. You know why? Because I have personal knowledge of the shepherd. I know his voice. And one day he's going to call my name. Amen? Yes, sir. You know, the Bible teaches me that I got a new name in heaven. I wonder what it is. I got a new address, too. I had not got the numbers yet, but I'm a dual citizenship. I got two passports. One I keep in a drawer at the house, and God keeps the other one because it's for a city not made with hands in the heavenly. Oh, and I'm waiting for that day when he'll present me with that new passport. But I praise God for Susan, for her testimony, even when she was in pain. He would say the chief could. We had vacation Bible school out here one year and it was hot, so hot. And she was going to help and she had a cooling vest. Y'all may not know what that is. But she had to get that thing filled up with ice or water or whatever. And she had to wear it when she went outside to eat. She couldn't stand the heat. And she didn't flinch a bit. She'd go out there and work and play with the kids and come back in. I went out there to play with the kids, and I come right back. Here. I, you know, I, I just couldn't, you know. Sometimes getting older, I can't take the heat like I used to. And, you know, none of y'all know what that's like. No. Uh, but if it happens. But the second thing I find out here is the prescriptive care of the shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. If you want to find out how to take care of some of your problems, you go to the great physician and he'll give you a prescription for special care. And there's nothing quite as meaningful to me as he says, I'm going to make you lie down in green pasture. Not so dried up Ceresa Hay pasture. I'm talking about green grass. It's something about that that's calming, isn't it? And he said, I'm going to lead you beside the still waters. Now, I like that. Yeah. We used to have a fish tank. Had 23 fish in it. Every one of them was female. I had a cat. Female. Had a dog. 
female. I got a wife and two kids. Female. I was surrounded by nothing but female. Tomcat run off. <laughs> you know why he ran off? One of them females in my house put a bell around his neck so he couldn't bring baby squirrels back into our back porch. And I never saw him again. <coughs> he starved to death up in the tree. <laughs> Prescriptive care. Our Lord Jesus loves us so much that if we'll take our cares to him, he said, don't worry about what it is. He said, cast all your cares upon me, for I am able to bear them. He is our burden bearer. He was Susan's burden bearer. She knew what it was to have that prescriptive care of the Lord in her life to help her through those trying times and days. Verse 3 says something about the providential love of the shepherd. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his Name right. Not mine. His name say. You know, it's kind of like this. If we're Christians and we belong to God, you know, when we show out in this world, it depends <clears throat> on our parents. Don't you remember when you used to go out and you lived at home and they'd tell you, you be nice now because it'll reflect back on us. <coughs> my daddy and my wife. You watch your tongue today, boy, while you're out. I don't want nobody calling me. You watch what you do and where you go. I don't want the cops calling me because it reflects on me. If you're a born-again believer, every action, every word, everything you do reflects on your heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I told folks up there that I know we've got a Methodist preacher in here, and I, I can't help it. i got to tell you. <laughs> I told my church, I said, if you get mad at me at the church, and you go out there and start talking, running down the church and running down the preacher. And they asked you, what church you go to? I said, you better tell them you go to First Methodist up in here. <laughs> serve the Lord Amen. and to do his good pleasure not hers you know most folks like that like she was they could throw it in a towel on church right. or God right. God why have I got this why am I burdened with this why right. you ever question God about your life you don't have that peace that passes all understanding Right. Susan had a peace that passed all understanding. Because she still loved the church, she still loved the Lord, and she still loved people. Mm -hmm. Even in the midst of trials. I hope none of you ever have to go through what Susan Britt went through. Yeah. And I hope if you ever do, you'll have the same attitude she had about living. She's a testament to the love of God 
and the power of God Amen. and the peace of God Amen. in a person's life. Verse 4 talks about this perfect protection of the shepherd. I like being protected by the shepherd. Amen. Amen. Said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Perfect protection. <coughs> the shepherd would protect his sheep mm -hmm. against all odds. You know the story in the Bible about the 99 and the one that's missing. Mm -hmm. I put the 99 in a sheep fold and told the people in there, say, those are mine, I'll come get them in the morning. Or where are you going? They're storming out here, lightning. I'm going, I got one missing, I'm going to go get that sheep. Can you imagine him wandering out there with no flashlight? <laughs> he might have had a torch with him looking for that sheep because of his protective care. He had one missing and he got to go get it. Even though all the folk around him said, look, he got 99, how many more you want? <laughs> Just that one more is mine. That's the way the Lord is. That's the way he operates. He won't say one. And somebody said, well, that can't be that important. He said, it's important to that one, amen? Yeah. It's important to that one. I don't know what's keeping the Lord from coming back. I look for him every day. Amen. I look for him to come back every single day. Why? Look at the world we live in. Look Amen. at the chaos going on. The murder and the rape and the penance and, and the thievery and the liars and the cheaters that are in this world. And I'll tell you something, a lot of them get up on Sunday morning and sing in the choir. <laughs> God's waiting on that one more. One more. You may be that one more. I hope you don't leave here today not knowing for sure in your heart that you're going to heaven when you die because there's only one other choice. It's called hell. Heaven or hell. No in between. You either get right or you get left. That's it. Because his protective care is right there for us. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Susan didn't fear anything. She'd just gone up to Kentucky to talk with the doctors about putting a device like a uh, thing in there to stimulate. And she'd come home making decisions about it. Well, that could be worked out. Lord Jesus came and knocked it. Said, You're not going to need that thing. You're not going to need no more shunts. And you're not going to need no more ports. You're not going to need no more IVs. And you're not having any more feeding tube. And you got to take no more pain medication. All this other stuff to ward off infection. You don't have to take none of that anymore. Really? Really? I'm taking you home. Mm -hmm. I'm taking you home. That's his protective care, too. We don't know what two months down the road might have been, a year down the road. We have no idea, but God did. I believe God came in there and his protective care took took her and said, that's it. My rod and my staff, they comfort you, comfort me. And I'll prepare some table before me in the presence of my enemies. Amen. <coughs> well, why would you want to set a big table full of food in the midst of all your enemies? Well, one of the reasons the Bible says you need to invite them in to sit down and eat with you 
And the other reason is he holds the fire on her head when you do good to him. I like to see some of them get their hair on fire. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more verse. This is the greatest provision of all. The eternal provision of the shepherd. Eternal. Everlasting. Never ending. Provision. <coughs> Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting on that day, amen? amen. <clears throat> I'm waiting on that day. And I told the doctor the other day, I went in, and I said, Doc, if I knew I was going to live this long, I took better care of this body. <laughs> And he said, well, you may live 20 more years. I said, I hope not. <laughs> not in this body. <laughs> what ain't broke don't work. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, when you have me coated up the corn at Rutherford, you talk to Martin, you tell him, he said, look, you save all that titanium I got in him, maybe we can sell it. <laughs> and I don't know where it's the second market for used titanium gives the joints and stuff. But anyway, but I'm ready for the Lord to come back. Amen. Amen. I'm almost envious. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven when one of the saints. Can you imagine the rejoicing that went on when Susan Britt and God called her name? Can you imagine the celebration? We celebrate down here, but it's nothing like what they're doing in heaven. Amen. Amen, brother. I love that man, his wife, the family, and sisters. Miss Betty, I love them just like my own family. Mm -hmm. And it breaks my heart to see their heart broken like it is. Mm -hmm. But we mourn not like others. Right. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning those we mm -hmm. We don't mourn like those we know. We rejoice in the fact that we know where she is. Amen. Now, we wouldn't want her back like she was for nothing in the world. Right. But praise God, we can all go see her. Amen. 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 You just have to make that decision. Do you know Christ Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you by faith asked him to come into your heart? believe that he is the son of God and he died on Calvary's tree and shed his precious blood for you you believe that if you believe that and he's coming back why don't you put your faith and trust in him the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's exactly how Susan got to where she is right now. With that first step, accepting the Lord as her Savior. I want to thank all y'all for being here. I know some of you, most of you I don't. And I know y'all all here for Randy and Sonia and the family. You're all here because they're special to you. Well, it would be remiss if I didn't tell you how much they appreciate you being here. And every act of kindness that you've shown this way, your prayers, your visits, mostly your prayers, lift them up, have them be covered daily. <laughs> 
every hour of the day in prayer. Because we don't really understand. Because we just see through a glass darkly. But one day, when we see him face to face, we will be as, as he is, and then all are made clear. So what we have left, we have the living word of God. It's alive. They tried to destroy this book since its first inception. And it's still the best seller in the world. Brandy, is there anything to follow this service? Okay. I know everyone is here for different people I know and here for different, you know, specific reasons. And I know Sonia, I do thank you for coming. Well, there's another preacher here. He pastored this church at one time. He ate all the food he could find. <laughs> Randy and Sonia preached the table. He lived on their place. Went to school. And he loves his family just like and I'm partial to him because he's my son-in-law. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Brother Rodney to do part if he would dismiss us in prayer. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for this celebration service today. We have been truly blessed with the testimonies of friends and others and family members, Lord, of Susan's life here on this earth. And Thank you for the circle of influence that she's had on so many people. And Lord, just continue to walk with us as we are those living testimonies and lives in this earth. And Lord, that we might point others to that same uh, direction towards you, oh God. We pray for that today. God, again, we continue to ask for comfort, and we just lift up this family. And watch over us and keep us safe as we go home this evening and hopefully and prayerfully that we'll be in your house in the morning praising your name and continuing to thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I have another invitation for y'all. Y'all don't have a place of regular attendance. <laughs> so I already know how to get out here. And there will be more room. You got more. Oh yeah, there's more.